We all know that the Emperor was the big guy in Rome, the number one, the first among equals, and that a whole lot of importance and key decisions laid on his lap. But who was number two? After the Emperor, who was the second in command? And most importantly, after the Emperor passed away, who would take the reign of the Empire? This second in command position was the Caesar. Just like the Emperor, these important men had coins struck with their image and their names. So how about we go on yet another tour of Roman coinage and look at some of the coins struck by these men? Let's go! With the end of the Republic and the introduction of the political reforms under Augustus, we see the appearance of the position of Emperor, or Augustus in Roman terms. Although there were attempts to hide the fact that Rome had become something very similar to a monarchy with fancy titles like princeps or first among equals, the truth is that, to most practical effects, power was highly concentrated on the hands of one very powerful individual, the Emperor. And with any regime that concentrated a lot of power in the hands of someone who would have this power for life, the question of who would get this important position after the current emperor was dead was a constant question up in the air. And seeking to solve this issue, Augustus instituted the position of Caesar, and yes, the name was inspired after Julius Caesar, by designating the future emperor, Tiberius, as heir and changing his name to Tiberius Julius Caesar. From that time onwards, any designated heir to the position of emperor would have the same Caesar to his name. So as you can see, the position of Caesar became a symbol of official recognition as future heir, and as second in command after the emperor, who, and this would catapult you into the center stage of Roman politics. And one of the perks of this position would be to have coins with your face be struck after all, people had to see the face of who would assume this central position on the Roman state. So today I've brought a bunch of coins struck for these individuals in different time moments. Let's take a look at some of them. And we start this little tour by showing how the matter of succession to the position of emperor could be a rather problematic one. We are in the 2nd century AD, the golden age of Rome. Emperor Hadrian is growing old and sickly and he does not have a son the most typical person to be chosen as Caesar by the ruling emperor. Hadrian is faced with the need to adopt and designate an heir to the position of Caesar, and he picks Lucius Caonius Commodus, a fellow aristocrat close to him and current consul, to receive this honor. So this leads us to our first coin, a denarius, struck with the image of this new Caesar, renamed Lucius Aelius Caesar between 136 and 138 AD. Second century portraiture is really good. We can see on the obverse this very well sculpted bust of Aelius. Even when you have a little bit of wear, you can still appreciate it nicely, with all of the details from the shape of his face to the beard, very similar to what you can see in his marble busts. The legends are rather simple. His name and imperial title, Lucius Aelius Caesar. Heading to the reverse, we have Felicitas, the goddess of happiness. Maybe it was a message to the people of Rome that the good times were bound to continue and the proper man to lead them after Hadrian had been chosen. On the legends, we see the public positions Aelius already had, Tribunicia Potestas, so the power of tribute, and Cos Duo, consul two times. Sadly for poor old Hadrian, Aelius would pass away before him. This led Hadrian to have to pick yet another heir. And so he did. Among the ranks of the aristocracy, once again, another very well-distinguished senator, Titus Aurelius Boionius Antoninus, the future emperor Antoninus Pius, was picked as the new heir. Coins of Antoninus Pius as an emperor are very common, but before he assumed the purple, a scarce issue of coins of him as a Caesar were made, a few months between his ascension to Caesar and Hadrian's death. This is one of such denarii, struck just in the year 138. The coins of Antoninus typically show an older man with a gentle expression, but here we can see we have more of a middle-aged man. 
he does not wear the laurel crown just yet, as he was not emperor, and the legends show his new name, which is still missing the Pius he's famous for. It reads Imperator Titus Aelius Caesar Antoninus, a name he had for just a few months. <laughs> Imagine changing your name like three times in your lifetime, depending on your position in the Roman aristocracy. I love the reverse of this coin, especially for the condition. So Antoninus was very well liked by mostly everyone, being his wisdom and a really nice temperament some of the most common praises he received. So it is fitting for such a man to have Minerva, the Roman interpretation of Athena, on the reverse. Surprising level of detail on her clothing for such a tiny flat of the denarius. We can see her holding a spear, a shield, and a tiny little victory by her outstretched hand. The legends also mention Antoninus' position at the time. Tribunicia potestas consul. Antoninus himself would adopt Marcus Aurelius, which would be the next emperor. And Marcus <laughs> sadly would make but one mistake in his great reign. This mistake would be to raise his son, Commodus, to the position of Caesar. Oh Marcus, why couldn't you see the boy was trouble? Well, in this denarius, however, we can't see any signs of the megalomaniac man that he would become. Instead, we see just a young, 15-year-old boy, destined to greatness, like all emperors before him. On the legends, we can read Commodo Augusti Filius, so Commodus, son of the emperor, Germanicus Sarmaticus. Heading to the reverse, we have Spes, the goddess of hope, another typical reverse found on Caesars for very young emperors, with the legends Spes Publica, or the hopes of the public for uh, the hopes for a good reign. Unfortunately, things would not turn out that fine in contrast to what this very hopeful looking coin states. So moving forward in time a little bit, we get to the Severan dynasty in the beginning of the third century. After a bloody civil war, Septimius Severus is the new emperor and his two sons, Caracalla and Geta, were the designated Caesars. So far, so good. One emperor, two heirs to the throne. Problem is, they absolutely hated each other. Throughout Septimius's reign, a vast coinage celebrating his two sons was issued. How about we take a look at these two examples of <laughs> brotherly love? First, we look at Geta, the youngest. This piece was struck in the year 200 AD, when the young boy was just 10. Interestingly, we have a more of a teenage here instead of a child. There are quite a lot of different busts for the two brothers in different stages of their lives. As we can see, he doesn't wear the laurel wreath just yet, and the legends read Publius Septimius Geta, Caesar Pontifex, showing that even in such a young age, his father already pushed him into some sort of official position, a Pontifex, which was a priest, although it was rather unlikely he did any work at that age. Looking at the reverse, we have once more Felicitas. Just like with Aelius, it's a very common deity for Caesars, as she is often connected to the hopes of a better future. Once again, she can be seen with the Caduceus, the symbol of commerce, and the Cornucopia, the symbol of abundance, and the legends Felicitas Publica, translating to the happiness and good times enjoyed by the populace. Now let's head to his brother, the future emperor Caracalla. I love this particular denarius, the refinement in the style of the bust is really well made. Notice however that this is not an issue as Caesar. Caracalla was ascended to the position of co-emperor with his father when he was just 11 years old. So this coin is from the year 200 AD when he was 12, and here we see a child emperor. Of course he held no real power, and this was probably an attempt by Septimius to show that once he died, Caracalla would be sort of like a senior emperor, while Geta would be more of a second-in-command. Heading to the reverse, we have Sol, the sun god, holding the world in his hands and the spear. The legends read Pontifex Tribunicia Potestas Tertium. That means that by the time Caracalla was 12, he was supposed to be in his third year with Tribunician powers, which is a bit of a joke. How could a kid hold public office? But alas, these were there to reinforce an image of legitimacy through the image of public office and experience and involvement in public affairs. 
With the fall of the Severan dynasty, we enter the crisis of the 3rd century, and with it, an absolute meat grinder of emperors and their respective Caesars, as coup after, after coup, civil war after civil war claimed the lives of the current emperors, only to have the next emperor be killed off a couple of years later. We don't even know a whole lot about the many reigning emperors from this century, and their Caesars are even less known. But I thought about bringing at least one of such coins of these obscure characters so we could take a look at one. Here we have Erenius Etruscus, who reigned with his father, Trajan Decius, between 250 and 251 AD. So, <laughs> a little over a year. And why just a year? Because in 251, something unthinkable for a Roman emperor happened. Deci Decius and Erenius were killed in battle after being ambushed by a Gothic army. Who would have thought? the mighty Roman emperor killed by barbarians. His coinage is rather typical for the time. We see a rather generic looking bust of a young man wearing the radiate crown. This tendency of generic looking busts will become frequent in the 3rd century as there was simply not enough time for busts of the new emperors to be made and sent to the mint before these were <laughs> dead and replaced by a new emperor or a Caesar where the process of cutting new dyes would have to be made all over again. So, they just picked random, generic-looking portraits, and they used an older one to represent the emperor, and a younger one to represent whichever Caesar was in charge. As for the legends, we have the full imperial title of the Caesar. Quintus Erenius Etruscus Messius Decius, Nobilicimus Caesar, or Most Noble Caesar, the last bit. It's a rather cool reverse design. We have two clasped hands symbolizing peace and unity. By that time, this was just wishful thinking. The empire was spiraling into chaos. The legends read Concordia Augustorum, the concord and agreement of the emperors. Notice how ragged and rough looking the flat is. By that time, coins were still made in reasonable levels of quality, but I like the charm this particular coin has, and it shows how quality control in this time was starting to falter. It is so rough looking, while at the same time, the design themselves is rather well engraved. We carry on to the end of the 3rd century when the Tetrarchy, the group of four constituted by Diocletian, Maximian, Galerius, and Constantius, transformed the position of Caesar to fit a new political system. Diocletian was a reformer. He reformed the entirety of the imperial administration, the coinage, and, interestingly, the succession system. Diocletian thought the empire was too big to be ruled by one man, so he instituted the Tetrarchy, which means this rule of four. This new system would have two senior emperors and two Caesars, chosen by these emperors. After a term of 20 years, the emperors would step down, letting the Caesars take their place, and these new emperors would themselves elect new Caesars. But these Caesars would have real responsibilities and real power. Galerius was the Caesar of the Diocletian and responsible for Pannonia, Moesia and Thrace, while Constantius was Max Maximian's Caesar, being responsible for Gaul and Britannia. They answered to their respective Augusti, but they had troops to their, on their own and a great level of autonomy. So let's take a look at one of these quasi-emperor Caesar figures. The coinage for the Tetrarchy is hard to differentiate between emperors, as the styles are rather similar. This was actually made on purpose. So both of these coins were struck around the year 300. So let's take a look at our first piece. So this first coin is from Emperor Galerius, and we can only identify him by the legends, which read Galerius Valerianus Maximianus Nobilicimo Caesar. Heading to the reverse, we find one of the most common motifs for the Tetrarchs, the Genio Populi Romani type, celebrating the ingenuity and the perseverance of the Roman people by having it Incarn incarnated in its entirety in the shape of one deity. Imagine like the whole Roman people as one god, so to speak. That's what we see here. As for Constantius, the legends are a little bit different. We read Flavius Valerianus Constantius, Nobilicimo Caesar, once again. 
I love how this coin looks like it hasn't been cleaned. We have traces of deposits still present on the surface and some traces of silvering. It's almost like this coin came straight from the ground up to our trace. Really nice looking. The reverse looks similar to the one of Galerius, at least in the design, but the legends are a little bit different. This time, instead of celebrating the Roman people at large, it celebrates the spirit of the emperors and Caesars. We can read, Genio Augustorum et Caesarum Nostrorum, or to the prowess of our beloved emperors and Caesars. And finally, as we move to the late Roman Empire, we get to the <laughs> tragic story of one of my favorite Caesars. So, Constantine the Great had three sons. Constantius II, Constans, and Constantine II, which inherited the empire after his death. But Constantine had a previous child from a concubine. This son was Crispus, Constantine's firstborn, Poor Crispus, so much wasted potential. According to records, he was a very good military commander, a smart administrator, and he helped his father greatly establishing his sole rule as an emperor over quite a few battles. Sadly, Crispus was executed by Constantine under accusations of having a forbidden relationship with Fausta, the second wife of Constantine and mother of his remaining sons. Apparently, it was all a conspiracy by Fausta to get her sons to inherit the empire. And so it was that due to the conspiracies of this wicked woman, we don't talk about the capable Emperor Crispus nowadays. So here in this coin we see how, uh, uh, how Crispus was portrayed as an important military man. So this coin is attributed to the city of Aquileia in the year 320 AD. On the obverse, we see Crispus wearing full military armor, carrying a large oval shield and holding his spear, almost like pointing forward, almost like if he was right at the front lines waiting for an enemy charge. The legends display his name and title, Crispus Nobilicimus Caesar. On the reverse, we see two captives sitting down with their hands tied next to a Roman standard. On the standard, we read, Vota Ten, or Vota de Canalibus, a celebration of 10 years of service by Crispus. In fact, his track record of military victories is quite impressive. The legends Virtus Exercitus, the virtue of the army, celebrates his command of troops, which went all the way from Gaul and, and Germa Germania all the way to the area where the future city of Constantinople would be raised. As we can see, the position of Caesar was nearly as important, and I would say nearly as dangerous, as the position of emperor itself. Have you got a coin of a Caesar you particularly like? Particularly like? Frankly, it's, you could make an entire collection just of Caesars, and it would be very interesting. Let us know in the comment section down below what you have. I hope you liked this little episode. Please leave a like and consider subscribing if you did. Happy collecting, and I'll see you soon.